what I want to basically go through is that there is a way of understanding semi-metals by looking at topological insulators. So, um, although I'm going to be talking mostly about semi-metals, um, the semi-metals that I'm going to be talking about, almost all of them, can be realized if you break some sort of a doubling theorem in topological insulators. So there is some sort of a, as when, when, when um, um, uh, Professor Atlant showed the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, table of topological insulators, if you're kind of looking between the lines of topological insulators, there's always a semi-metal between them. So <clears throat> that's, that's kind of like what, what we're going to be talking about. So first I want to define semi-metals or the, the semi-metals that we're interested in. Semi-metals and enforced metals. Okay, and then I want to um, define doubling theorems. So sort of nielsen niemeyer type of theorems, but generalized. And then I want to look at how symmetries affect these theorems. Okay, and then we'll look at what happens when you break these doubling theorems. Breaking nielsen niemeyer and going to topological insulators. And of course, through this, we're gonna define invariants for um, um, the semi-metals, which are very much in the same spirit as invariants for, for, the, for, the, um, um, for the topological insulators. To make use of, of simplicity, I will focus on translation invariant systems, um, crystalline systems, but most of the time, well, most of the times, some of the times, and I'll indicate when, the um, uh, particularization to translation invariants is not needed. It's just a way of, 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 of making the, the physics transparent. So since I'm going to be talking about translation invariant systems, just to make the physics transparent, I'm going to be talking about lattices. And lattices, depending on their unit cell, this dot is, this, is a unit cell of a lattice. Um, and here I'm drawing a, a, a very simple one-dimensional lattice, have periodicity. And this periodicity is translated in, of course, Bloch's theorem or um, if I express Bloch's theorem in Hamiltonian form, it basically tells me that up to a unitary transformation, which I'm not going to write down, Hamil the Hamiltonian at momentum k in the lattice, after I Fourier transform and go to a, a reciprocal space, say from 0 to pi, k, is equal to the Hamiltonian at momentum k plus g, where g is a... a a reciprocal unit lattice vector, for example, on a 1D lattice such as this one is 2 pi over A, where A is the distance between unit cells. So what the first thing that we're going to do is try to look at what type of structures this Hamiltonian can give. And, and you know, in, in, in mathematics, this is very, uh, you know, it's very easy to classify um, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what type of structure, single particle Hamiltonian, so I'm going to just focus on Hamiltonians that look like they've got C dagger C terms in them and maybe C dagger C dagger terms in them, so superconducting Hamiltonians. But first I want to ask what is um, a, a semi-metal and um, or a protected semi-metal or kind of give you give a hint of what we're trying to what we're trying to look at. So it's basically a semi-metal is something that has at least some sort, some amount of protection to interactions, disorder. Um, anything, anything like that. And those protections could be either because disorder is average and on average keeps the symmetry of, that, I'm, that we're going to be talking about, or because the band structure of the non-interacting semi-metal has very low density of states when you place the Fermi level where you want it to be, which is you know, uh, close to the zero density of states, and as such interactions aren't very efficient or effective at, at uh, when the density of states is zero. So we're basically looking for some sort of, um, um, of those type of, of things. And we're also looking for symmetry enforced semi-metal. So for example, the simplest example of symmetry enforced semi-metal is anything that has um, spin and Kramer's theorem. So let's just go through that. 
So first of all, I just want to um, um, define time reversal. I'm not going to be using it for the next 30 minutes, but I just want to define it. And I'm going to define time reversal, and this was already defined in many lectures before, but the fundamental thing that was also already defined is that time reversal can, for spin, for integer spin or half integer uh, spin particles, can square to one or minus one, so this is integer spin, it's an anti-unitary operator, and this is half integer spin. Okay. So, um, if I have, I'm going to be focusing on half integer spin mostly, so t squared equals minus one, and I'm just going to do a quick proof of Kramer's theorem. If time reversal is some unitary matrix times complex conjugation, and you need this unitary matrix to keep norms of states, and you need complex conjugation because you know, as was explained um, earlier, the, you know, you have e to the i h t, or you can just think of it as the commutator of a momentum and position. Time reversal changes momentum, so it has to change the commutator, but the commutator is i, so it has to change the complex conjugation. So it has to contain complex conjugation, which my operator is k. t squared equals minus 1 implies, is it obvious what it implies on this matrix? U, it has to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. Should I go through it? Yes. OK. So, so this means that uk, uk is equal to minus 1, but this is equal to u, u star, which is equal to minus 1. But u is a unitary matrix, so u, u dagger is equal to minus 1. Hence, u to the minus 1 is, sorry, thank you. So unitary, unitarity implies this. Time reversal squaring to minus 1 implies this. And it squares to minus 1 again for spin 1 half particles because you get a 2 pi times a 1 half rotation. So I apply time reversal twice. I get 2 pi times a 1 half rotation, which is e to the i 2 pi times 1 half, which is e to the i pi, which is minus 1. So u to the minus 1 here is equal to minus u star which is equal also to u dagger. Hence, this means that u transpose, I just take the star of this, or u is equal, minus u is equal to u transpose. So this is anti-symmetric matrix. U, and the fact that it's anti-symmetric matrix means the following, if you've got a Hamiltonian, and usually I haven't put a momentum here, so don't think of this Hamiltonian as, as a matrix. This is a Hamiltonian that's a second quantized Hamiltonian, so it doesn't contain just the matrix. It also contains the operators. So, for example, if I was to write it down in block space, in H would be sum over CK dagger H of K CK. Time reversal commutes with this operator. And if it commutes with this operator, this is some, you know, I can write it in real space. If I have an eigenstate psi of this operator, then t times psi is also an eigenstate by this. So now I have two options. Either t times psi is the same thing as psi, in which case I only have psi as an eigenstate, or t times psi is different than psi, in which case I have a double degeneracy. Okay? And you can clearly see that t times psi is, is different than psi by computing t psi is equal to 0, is equal to, well, by computing this expectation value. And this expectation value is 0. In some basis, I can just write this on components. This is this star, u, this u matrix mn, complex conjugation psi n, but complex conjugation on psi n is just psi star. This is anti-symmetric. So this is zero. So every state in a time reversal invariant system of spin one half comes with a Kramer's degeneracy. Now, does this mean that, so, you know, I can take so this is true, obviously I didn't tell you whether I have disorder or not, whether I have anything. This is always true for single particle Hamiltonians, even if I have disorder um, 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 or not. And it's always true for many body states of odd number of electrons. Okay? 
If I have odd number of electrons, time reversal will still act as a minus one because an odd number of spin one half can only add to something that's half integer spin, and I need to have two-fold degenerate ground states. If I have even number of electrons, many body states, on the many body subspace, time, time reversal squares to one. But on the single particle subspace, single particle being an odd number of electrons, one, uh, time reversal acts as t squared, and every single particle eigenstate, whether it be the sort or not, has a time reversal pair which um, is degenerate with it. This is just Kramer's theorem. Now, of course, if I decide to plot my energy as a function of momentum now, time reversal has another property. Time reversal is always local in real space. So whatever time reversal does to an operator, T, C, J of orbital alpha and spin up T to the minus 1 is equal to C, J, alpha, same orbital. This reflects same orbital, same unit cell. This is the unit cell, this is the orbital. This reflects that it's local in real space. Of course, it changes spin up to spin down. And T, C, J, alpha, up, uh, down, T to the minus 1, is equal to C, J, alpha, up, but with a minus sign. This is just the minus sign. So you know, in the up-down subspace, I represent time reversal as I sigma Y times complex conjugation, which is 0, 1, minus 1, 0 times complex conjugation. This is a unitary matrix. So it's just you know the same thing as here. OK, so if I take, if I represent my single particle states as a function of momentum, of course, because time reversal um, um, is local in real space, but the Fourier transform of the Hamiltonian, the Fourier transform of the, of the operator, CK alpha spin sigma, call it, this is sum up to 1 over square root of number of lattice sites, sum over CJ alpha sigma e to the i k j. This is the momentum, this is the unit cell. Now, plus another vector, but it doesn't matter, plus the distance from the unit cell. If I apply time reversal on this guy, this just moves, moves me into down, but this i here gets a minus sign, which basically flips the momentum. So time reversal at momentum k sends me into a state of momentum minus k. So if I resolve states by momentum quantum number, for every state, so this is say this is pi, for every state here, I have another state here, OK? But I also know that there's two momentas in the Brillouin zone in one dimension, four and two to the d in d dimensions, where time reversal doesn't flip the momentum, and that's 0 and pi. And that means that I need to have at 0 pi dub, the dub, double degeneracy. So I can't just have one band. So the minimal model with a time reversal invariant system is something that looks like this. This is a double degeneracy. This is a double degeneracy. Okay? And of course, the dub, you know, these states here at some energy are singly degenerate, but that's just because I resolve them by momentum. The Kramer's partner of this state is actually this one, if I was to not look at momentum. But really, where you see the Kramer's theorem at work in, where you clearly see it at work in band structures is at the time reversal invariant points. Does that make sense? Please interrupt me if it doesn't make sense. OK, so now the purpose of this little exercise, which you can find in any book, is to show you that, that actual condensed matter systems that will have one electron per unit cell, or an odd number of electrons per unit cell, have to be in four semimetals. Okay, so we're going to adopt a view that condensed matter systems are built out of, out of atoms, and those atoms have a number of electrons on them. They're not, they don't have a fractional number of electrons, they have an integer number of electrons. If I put atoms at, if I make a lattice here, okay, here I'm just going to put orbitals, say whatever, carbon for, if I make graphene or some other orbital, the point is this guy has an integer number of electrons. Of course, in condensed matter, I can do other things such as gate things or like, but that's actually just charge transfer for somewhere else. Okay? If I just build some material in free space, 
what will sit on the sides is going to be an element, and that element will have a number of electrons. Now, with odd number of electrons per unit cell, so let's just keep one electron per unit cell, odd being one being representative, so one electron per unit cell, um, is it clear that a time reversal invariant system has to be a semi-metal, has to be an enforced semi-metal? The reason for that is, of course, if I would fill the whole band here, how many electrons would I have per unit cell? If I filled, so I filled two bands. Two electrons per unit cell. If I didn't fill anything, I would have zero electrons per unit cell. Of course, what that means is really that you know, I have just core, the core levels of the atom. There's a lot of other bands here. They're just, it's just a filled shell of core levels. But if I have one electron per unit cell, the Fermi level has to be stuck in the middle, right? And, and there's really only two ways, and this is, this is a well-known theorem that basically tells you that, you know, in odd, nothing can be an ins, that, you know, in free particles, nothing can be an in insulator with odd number of electrons per unit cell, right? That's this, the, just what I said. Now, there's many ways of making this an insulator. Way number one, is breaking a symmetry. So how do we make, so this is an enforced semi-metal. Well, it's the simplest example of enforced semi-metal. I'll, you know, we'll go through like sim, uh, more, more interesting ones. And why do I call it enforced? Well, something enforces it, time reversal. If I would break time reversal and I have one electron per unit cell, it's very easy to make an insulator. I just put a huge magnetic field on the thing, and my bands look like this. If I put a huge, if my magnet, well, not magnetic field, but make it the system of ferromagnet. I, you know, I doubt you can ever put a huge magnetic field experimentally so that you can kill the whole bandwidth. These bandwidths are usually electron volts, um, but I can put, I can, you know, make the system go ferromagnetic, it will break time reversal. I have no degeneracy, no Kramer's degeneracy, singly degenerate, but now I can have one electron per unit cell. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> what enforced my semi-metallic nature was um, 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 was time reversal symmetry. If I break time reversal symmetry, I can get to one electron per unit cell. Now, there's another thing that tells me that in this case, in this particular case, it might not be that hard to break time reversal. And that's the fact that in one dimension, if I just keep this one dimensional, in one dimension, here I have a finite density of states, right? So if I, for any enforced semi-metal, is going to have, you know, density of states dk over energy here, which is the energy around the Fermi level is proportional to k, so vf dk, which is equal to 1, and You've got a finite density of states, so it's very likely that if you add interactions, you are going to actually get some sort of instability. And Pyrrhal's instabilities and all these, you know, forming spin density waves and charge density waves in one dimension come, come from this type, of, this type of, 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 of situation. So even though this is technically an enforced metal, it's a pretty crappy one. So um, we'll just, I just gave it for, for, for purposes of understanding what enforces it is just time reversal, and 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 um, and what um, how I would think of it in terms of in terms of you know putting electrons per per um, unit cell. Now the next type of semi-metal, which is actually not enforced, which is much nicer that I want to look at. Yes. Well, yeah, it's a metal. It's an enforced metal. You're right. I mean. Semi-metal, so, so, so this, yeah, you're right, I misspoke. It's an enforced metal. Yeah. The thing is, if I move to higher dimensions, I can make it an enforced, I can make with, this, with the same time reversal, I can make a semi-metal, by which I mean the density of states at the Fermi level would need to vanish. So then it's a semi-metal. But yeah, you're right, I misspoke. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enforced metal, which is, right, why was, what else? Okay. So metals and semi-metals, at least to zeroth order, you can just define them by having finite density of states or zero density of states. Then you can move forward. But of course, um, 
one, as Alexander pointed out, this, is, this has finite density of states, so I should really call it a metal. Very good. Okay, so <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to do is the following band structure, which is just one band, so now I'm going to go spinless. Okay, no spin, so t squared is equal to plus one, but I'm not going to even require time reversal. Okay, this is just a simple, simple one band of spinless electrons. Now notice how this guy, if I realize it from atoms on a lattice, can never be a metal. Okay? If I realize it from atoms on a lattice, my lattice, I have one atom per unit cell, it's one band, one atom, one orbital per unit cell. That orbital can be either occupied or empty. So the Fermi's level either sits here or here. Okay? This is the most boring thing you can ever think of. Of course, you can dope it, you can put it on a substrate, dope it. This is still, the Fermi level is a many body quantity, so it tells you how you fill the band. The band by itself, as a function, you know, energy as a function of k, is a single particle quantity, and it tells you where you can fill things. But if you think about it from an actual chemical perspective of atoms, you can't fill this unless, you know, you put it on a substrate, you put a doping, you take charge from the substrate and then you can fill somewhere. But even if you fill like this, this, you know, I take a gate and I fill it, say, up to here, there's still a 2kf uh, wave vector that can kind of connect points on different Fermi surfaces. There's no real Fermi surfaces, they're just Fermi points, point one and point two. And this system will also, you know, enlarge its unit zone, form a 2kf instability, and if you add interaction, it will do a charge density wave or other things. Well, this, this guy can't do very much. Um, and that's also because it has a finite density of states here. So this is no bueno. The other one that I am going to look at is just this guy. So E versus K, this guy. Now, this guy is very interesting because there's no way you can realize something like this in just one dimension. And let's just go through the arguments of why you can't realize this. So I've only talked about one-dimensional systems. Let's go through the arguments of why you can't realize this in one dimension and why nothing that you, can, that you would ever do to this guy, such as add superconductivity, form a charge density wave, do anything. If this single particle spectrum is like this, this is a stable semi-metal, despite the fact that it's got a large density of states here. Okay, this has got a large density of states here. It's just kind of like half of this branch. Okay, well, it's immediately obvious that this cannot be realized just in a one-dimensional lattice because if I really have one-dimensional lattice, I have the following theorem that my spectrum at k has to be equal to my spectrum at k plus g. So if this is zero and this is two pi, that's bad. This is the same statement as, you know, a periodic function in one dimension has to have both positive and negative derivatives and in any dimension really. This is just that mathematical statement, okay? But now notice that whatever I do to this, so say I want to impose an instability on it, say my Fermi level is somewhere here and I want to impose some instability, say whatever, five unit cell charge density wave or two unit cell density wave, some instability in the system that would make me have non-zero density of, or they make me have zero density of states at the Fermi level. So by the way, when an instability occurs, like in this case, a gap usually opens and the density of states at the Fermi level is zero. Okay? So, um, so in this case, I will never be able to do this and you can kind of see this because, for example, let's just do two unit cell instability, so just kind of dimerizing. So <clears throat> you can see this because if I did a two unit cell instability, the only thing that I need to do is fold this, right? So instead of having uh, a, a, my unit cell goes from A to 2A, I have some sort of, you know, charge density wave on each side, like my sites are not equivalent, okay? I go from here, all that I'm doing is I'm making the momentum go from zero to two pi, go, which it was before, go from zero to pi, okay, in this new unit cell. So all that I'm doing is I'm basically folding. So I can do this five unit cells or any amount of unit cells. So what you're gonna do is just fold the system in, in say this is two pi, now this would be two pi over say five A, 
if the, your unit cell was 5A, okay? So 2 pi over 5, okay? So <coughs> if you're going to do this, all you need to do is fold this. So you're going to take this, you're going to fold it. You're going to take this thing, you're going to fold it. You're going to take this thing, you're going to fold it. But you can clearly see that I still have, so I go through the Brillouin zone, I connect to this one here, through the Brillouin zone, I connect to this one here. Anywhere I put my Fermi level, I've gone from finite density of states to, again, finite density of states. I've done nothing. There's no way to gap this by creating an instability and folding it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, so that's, 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 that's exactly. So how can I get this? That's exactly the point. Let me tell you again, let me give you one more example of the, the fact that this can't exist. Right? I mean, it exists, because otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. But, but it is the quantum Hall effect. It's a known. OK. Another example, you can try to gap it with superconductivity. So have this band like this and try to gap it with superconductivity. What superconductivity does is it takes energy to minus energy, particle hole, and takes momentum to minus momentum, right? If you look in the uh, superconducting classes um, that were shown in the, uh, um, the previous uh, lectures, you can see that this is what it does. So what I would do, this, let's call this a chiral Dirac fermion in one dimension, okay? We're just going to give it a name. Chiral Dirac fermion in one dimension. This is this energy, energy. This is momentum. I pick a momentum zero here. This is EK. You can clearly see that all that I've done is I've taken E to minus E would create this mode, OK? But K to minus K, again, changes it to chiral. So what I've done is I've changed one Dirac mode, one Dirac chiral mode, into two modes. But these two modes have an E to minus E redundancy, which is the superconducting particle hole symmetry. I, I call it in quotes symmetry. So redundancy. So all I've done, actually, if you, you, you follow the field, is like you just change a chiral Dirac into two chiral Majoranas. I can just re-represent it the same way. OK. Certainly haven't gapped anything, fully gapped. OK, the next thing that I can do to show you that this type of feature cannot exist is show you that it's related to an anomaly. OK, so if I had this type of band structure, I would have an anomaly. And anomalies are many body effects also. I mean, you can express them in single particle. But anomalies are quantum field theory effects. And as such, they're, they exist in many body also, not just in single particle. But we're going to show it from single particle. So to, this is my k. This is my momentum. Actually, on a lattice, k comes in 2 pi over number of sites in units of 1 over the lattice constant times j. j equals 1 to nx. OK? This is my energy. What's my many-body ground state? Filling all the lower levels. OK? All these levels are filled. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this system on a circle. If, it, if I could realize it in purely one dimension, which I obviously can't, because I was right, it's clear. But if I could, I could just put it on a circle. If I put it on a circle, I'm going to insert flux here, OK? Which goes from. 0 is the flux is 2 pi as a fun 2 pi times time and time goes between 0 and 1 okay why am i doing this well i'm doing i'm inserting a flux 2 pi inserting a flux 2 pi makes your spectrum your initial spectrum and your final spectrum be the same cuz you know if you inserted flux pi you'd shift momentas from you know 2 pi over nx to um, uh, pi times 2, uh, whatever, 3 pi over an x. You shift them. You wouldn't have the same spectrum. I want to compare states with the same spectrum. So I just turn on a flux here. Now, of course, this flux is related to an electric field. OK? So integral of E dot dl, OK, around this, around this cylinder where my atoms live. Integral of dl is equal minus partial partial d partial t 
integral of b dot ds, this is the flux, so is equal to 2 pi. Okay? Clear? So, but also, another thing is equal, so e, this is constant, so e is 2 pi over nx, right? This is e times l, l is the length of the thing. Well, L, L, is, L is nx times a. I'm taking a to be 1, okay? Just the lattice constant. In reality, it's angstroms, right? But e is 2 pi over nx. But e is also momentum dot in this direction, k dot, right? K, this k dot. So what I see that when time goes from 0 to 1, if I do this thing slowly, my wave function has changed has shifted all the momentas to k plus 2 pi over L, right? Or over nx. Does that make sense? Please ask questions if, like, you know. Right, so. I mean, it's either too, too simple or, uh, you know, or I'm doing a poor job, which I, the latter might be. Both might be true. So just ask me if uh, there's anything, or if you want me to go faster, ask me also. Okay, so what this means is that while my single particle spectrum, so these difference between these two momentas, the difference here, as you can see, between two, two ADS and momentas is 2 pi over nx. You can see it here, j and j plus 1. I just shift all of them. The single particle, the Hilbert space, remains the same, but the actual state, what the actual state has done, so the Hilbert space are just the particle, the levels that I can take, but the, if I look at its action on the state, I've taken this electron, right? I'm just shifting all of these occupied states here up because I have an electric field that pulls them out of this. This is zero energy. I shifted this here up one. So there's a difference between these two states of one electron. So from a free system, if this was really a 1D system, from a free system, I just do a basically a gauge transformation and I get one more electron. So charge is not conserved and that's a big problem. Of course, <coughs> this all tells you that basically this system cannot uh, exist in, in, in one dimension, right? There's nothing, there's no problem with the band conservation, there's no problem with anything. It just tells you that this system is not a good 1D system. So what's the solution? Of course, the solution is that if I've taken one charge and put it on this system here, I have to take that one charge away from somewhere else. And the other system that I can take one charge away from is also a 1D system, right? Well, it's also, sorry, it's also a, a, a system of the same vein with, with, you know, a weird system that cannot be realized in 1D, right? And in purely in 1D. And what does he have to have as opposed to this? What, like, what does he have to have different? If the other system, so here I'm adding one charge, I have to take one charge away. What has it got to, what has, had to, what has to change? The chirality of the eye. So this is of course, and this cannot be 1D, okay? So obviously um, um, it has to be higher dimensional. And of course, what happens is that I can think of this, of this 1D um, uh, dispersion as one edge of a 2D sample where I have chiral mode on one edge, an anti-chiral mode on the other edge, and here a bulk which is gapped. The reason why I want it gapped is if it wasn't gapped, I would get contributions from the bulk that would depend on, you know, scattering times, etc. I want just to, you know, get exactly this anomaly, okay? And this is called an anomaly. And of course, if you were to draw the spectrum of this system, and notice that I'm drawing the spectrum of the system with periodic boundary conditions in this direction, but open boundary conditions in this direction. So this is something that we're going to be doing a lot. It's called the hybrid picture, where I just Fourier transform in one direction, but not, not, not in the other. If I draw the spectrum of this system, well, I'll have one chiral mode for this state, 
I'll have another chiral mode for the other state here. Okay, this anti-chiral. Okay, now of course these have to go somewhere, as we said, they cannot be just one D, but there's quite a bit of bulk states here that they can go in. How many bulk states will I have, do you think? So say my system here is NY sites. How many bulk states do you think I'll have of the order? Right? These, are, these are states which are localized somewhere here. These are states which are localized on the edge. How many of these will I have? So say I have a Hamiltonian of NY sites, right? Single particle. How many, what, how big is this matrix of the Hamiltonian of NY sites? NY by NY. How many energy levels does an NY matrix have? NY. So for each momentum, this is a momentum quantum number, right? There's a matrix NY by NY matrix for every momentum quantum number. So how many, obviously the edge for every momentum quantum number, one edge has one state. So how many states will I have order in the bulk? Of the order NY minus T. Okay. So order NY. In fact, you need more orbitals to make the system. So it's really two NY. But you need a two orbital system to make an insulator in the bulk. But we'll get to that. OK. And there's a reason why this. So there's two things that we now have to ask. Well, first of all, is this an interesting insulator? Is this an interesting insulator? Well, it's an insulator only in the bulk. And it's got edge states on the edge, so it's a topological insulator of the kind that you've heard up to now, without any symmetry. I haven't talked about any symmetry. Spinless, no time reversal. In fact, you need time reversal breaking for this to exist because the modes move in just one direction. Logical quantum hole insulator class A, what? A? Class A. Okay? And what it does is, of course, you can clearly see that what this insulator did is as I thread flux like this, so threading flux now is this direction. I thread, I thread flux, right? Thread flux like this. I added a charge here, took over a charge here. So I made a current in this direction. But the electric field was in this direction, right? A flux threading like this is equivalent to having an electric field that goes like this. I have an electric field in this direction, current, charge transfer in this direction. So this is really a quantum hole effect. And how many electron charges have I transferred? Well, one on one edge. So J is equal to Jx is equal to, or Ji is equal to epsilon Ij Ej. So Jx is equal to Ey. Okay, And there's a number here, there's a coefficient, which is called the Chern number, which is the topological invariant, which, in fact, just counts the number of edge states okay, on one edge. All right, so what's the more? Yes, yes. 